We've got a job on our hands. We've got to talk about um, regulation, which is not always the, the most, uh, the easiest of subjects to cover, but we're going to try and make it as animated as we can. Um, we're going to talk about um, MIFID II, because obviously that's, um, for those of you getting ready for it, it's only about 85 days away, and that's not including holidays. So basically that means that uh, if you're working on it, it's a pretty full-time activity. So I want to kick off by um, uh, just giving you, sharing some numbers with you, because this is a very different beast to MIFID I. Uh, first of all, hands up everybody who's tried to read all 15,000 pages of it. <laughs> apart, from, <laughs> apart, from, <laughs> apart from Hugh Cumberland. In fact, I, Rob, I haven't actually read all 15,000. I've tried, but I it's... I did, yes, <laughs> okay, he's, he's right. Um, 12 times larger than MIFID one. So that gives you a, a rough idea of how much more complex we're looking at. Um, secondly, uh, two and a half times as many fields to report. And Steve was mentioning about the need to get uh, reporting right. I mean, this really is uh, the potential for um, the opportunity to commercialize on data or death by data by drowning in it. So some numbers to share with you. And there's a consultancy called uh, Opimus. I hope I'm saying this right. Uh, we did some very useful work at the start of the year, saying that it was going to cost the industry th something like two and a half billion euros. I don't know what the panel's view is on, on the numbers, but two and, two and a half billion of sunk cost in terms of implementation and 700 uh, million a year annually for five years. And that's pretty chunky. Uh, the tier one banks, 31% of the cost. Um, the tier twos and tier threes, 52%. The asset managers, 14%. And here's the thing that really uh, I found really quite surprising. The exchanges and MTFs, uh, only 3%. So this, this time around, <clears throat> it's almost a complete reversal from uh, MIFID one because that, ha that really did impact the exchanges. Typical tier one investment bank, 40 million. Typical tier one asset manager, 8 million. And in terms of the three domains of MIFID, you're looking at investor protection, 13%, one in eight uh, uh, pounds being spent. Trading just under 30%, 28%, and reporting, record keeping, the remainder. That's just under 60%. <clears throat> so there's an awful lot of uh, complexity to be managed. And we're going to divide our session into two sections. The first is going to look at really, in those 85 days, what are the outstanding actions? What can we expect to see? And the panel's going to bring this to life for you. What are they working on? What should you be doing and considering? What should you not be considering? Um, really, what's the impact on, on getting it right? What are the right things? The second part of the session is going to look at a new area. We're going to look at some of the new risks that em might emerge from MIFID II. And also, uh, Henry's there to be my wingman on other regulations as well. Because GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, isn't that far behind. And there's talk about CSD regulation, which Henry is going to extol. So uh, we're going to try and bring this to, my, to life from both a pre- and a post-trade perspective by uh, using, um, the, um, well, using the opportunity to really uh, discuss uh, what the panel is saying. So to my left is Catherine, Catherine Woodrow from Bank of New York. I'm sure you've all got the program, so I'm sure you've seen the uh, bios, which are pretty impressive. I'm going to lead off with Catherine before handing over to Len Delicate from Trax and Henry Ration from HSBC. And each of them, in turn, are going to give you, share with you some thoughts about what they're seeing in terms of uh, the countdown to MIFID II. And indeed, is MIFID II going to be a big bang? Or is it going to be the start of something really quite substantial right throughout 2018? So don't want to steal your thunder, Catherine, but why not kick off and uh, share your thoughts with okay, us? Okay, well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me here today on the panel. Um, I head up the... The, the markets business MIFID program at BNY Mellon. And obviously we, like many other firms, are at the stage of the, the final final push. Um, we've been very focused on our program um, for more than a year now. And um, it, it does feel like we are at the stage where we, we have to, despite all of the uncertainty that we are all you, you know, very aware of and we can talk a bit about, we have to make some firm decisions now. We know what path we're set on, what we are going to be able to deliver, and to ensure that we've got all the, the relevant 
evidence of our decisions and where there are areas that we feel that will need to be either imp improved or remediated or even started in 2018, why we have plans that go on well into next year and why we will have um, a MIFID programme that certainly continues through Q1, probably uh, through Q2 as well next year. Um, so, so yes, it's a very interesting stage to be at at the firm, um, and we we're certainly still dealing with that delivery aspect, but also some of the the areas that are still areas that the industry are discussing and are challenged with. What's uh, <clears throat> I think what's fair to mention as well is I don't think the regulators have nailed down all the aspects of MIFID two uh, just yet. Uh, we, we've had um, several of the European regulators, sometimes in, in print, uh, saying there are quite a few open areas. And it could be questions like, will we have enough legal entity identifiers um, assigned in time? And let, I can see Len nodding his head there furiously, because it's, it's going to be his turn next. <laughs> and uh, what about who might or might not be a systematic internalizer? Or how do you treat the issue of foreign exchange and foreign exchange forwards? Or how long is a piece of string when it comes to best execution evidencing? So, Len, very quickly, uh, on the topic, I know you and I very have had quickly. lots <laughs> of conversations, trade reporting, transaction reporting. Yeah. I'm assuming everybody in the audience knows what those are, but could you want to just give us a little bit of a walkthrough, a counter, in terms sure. of what you're saying? So I think, um, so I talked to a lot of buy-side firms, because I think that's the, the really big wave in MIFID II is, is the buy-side, because they, in the UK anyway, um, they did very good negotiation back in 06 and 07 around MIFID one and had an exemption, as you all know. So I've probably spoken to upwards of 100 plus buy side firms. And I think the key thing, first of all, is, is matrix management. And, and that's, Tony t was a, did a beautiful entry into it. Talk to, talk to those above you, beside you, and below you about exactly who's being an SI and who can do things on your behalf. So a lot of buy side firms are looking, depending on the assets and the strategies that they take, um, if they don't want to do, let's start with transparency first, because that's the uh, that's the first one in the flow, right? The T people call it T one or T fifteen minutes or T reporting, it's the trace like report. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone's saying, you know, will firms be an SI? Can I provoke my traders just to trade on a venue or with SIs? Um, and that's always a very opsy and compliancy view. You talk to the front office, you're like, forget that, man. I got P&L to make here. I'm trying to run a business. I want to talk to my Russian, American, Swiss brokers. Don't tell me who to talk to. So depending on how that interplay works out, um, you can either decide then if you need to trade report or not, or if you can rely on other people. So there's that picture, and it is, it's a very moving picture. And things will be, you know, SIs probably won't be telling you if they're SIs until Christmas time and, or January even, right? And that's... Um, and then look at your market. So where you're on a venue, will the, will the venue do it for you? Um, and then, but will that venue be an OTF or an MTF? And have they come out and said what the rule book is? Have they updated the rule book for MIFID II? So there's a lot of moving parts with that. Um, and then there's the, the data sourcing is a big thing under uh, uh, transparency. It's usually done at the fixed level. Um, we sit on a fixed working group to try to get some industry uh, uh, consistency around you know, what needs to be reported. So that's quite big. Uh, corporate actions is another thing that's not sorted out, along with what's in, a, you know, which of FX products are in. So the product scope isn't nailed down. And I think that um, the biggest thing you can do is is have a big budget number for senior management, whether you're a service provider, buy side or sell side, and and, and highball, you know, the number of people that you need ring fence to deliver this. What was slightly, what was interesting? I won't say slightly worrying. What was interesting is the number of people that really took a big holiday in August and really got mobilized on the 1st of, of September. It's not the big, big firms, of course, but um, there's a lot of guys who are trying to fit MIFID into the last third of the year. Um, so we're seeing you know, a lot of people rushing to, to get things completed. And you mentioned uh, <clears throat> the big numbers, and I mentioned 40 million for a typical IB or um, a fifth of that for your typical larger money manager in terms of euros. Um, can you see? benefits arising from that spend? Or is it mainly cost? Is it cost deferral for the future? Is it keeping regulators and your clients happy? Can you tell us a little bit yeah, about that? Yeah, two things always on that is the data. If you can use the data internally, then then good for you. If you can manage off of it, and, and, and that's what the regulator wants you to do. Because as you know, if you consume data internally, it's usually better quality. No one messes up P&L, no risk. Why? Because you get yelled at by a trader, right? This is how, that's how life is. If you can look at best decks and TCA 
if you can use, so, so buy side firms are talking to us about, okay, you have this big pipe of data from me, can I use some of that, so in, in that data, the quality of it will be very good, be very high fidelity, very fast um, for transaction reporting or trade reporting. So people are thinking, can I leverage that for other things like MAD or MAR? And so I think now they're thinking cleverly because if there's a feedback loop internally, when our friends at uh, the North Colonnade finally see it, hopefully that can be in better. So, so that's a possibility, and you probably have, you guys probably have views. I, on that I was going to add to that and say, you know, certainly internally, when we put our MIFID budget numbers in front of our executive board, and they they almost fall off their chairs, that we have to evidence why there are some benefits, and it is that data. You know, this this is forcing us to to get a handle finally on our data, and it's not just you know, end of day data, this is real time use of our internal data. It will help us manage our, our clients and start to look more strategically as to how we operate going forward if we get this data model right. Can I ask you a question then? So if you're an SI, so there's unbundling of costs, right? So you have, if you're an SI, you, you might have to provide, you know, trade reporting for, for the buy side firm or for your client, I should say. So, and, and, then, and then for the buy side, that's a minefield because if there's five prices, three are from SIs, two are from non-SIs, guess which ones might be better? But I guess the, the question for you is, to the extent that you have to unbundle services, you know, like, like, like Amir, all the delegated reporting, like Amir, people don't necessarily want to do that for Mifid too. Do you think that will actually give ops a bit more value because they have to nominate what they're doing separate from the price? They can't soft dollar it in, in pricing, or is that, are you guys implementing that yet? Uh, you mean from the angle of being a systematic internalizer? Yeah, um, yeah. So we certainly, obviously, aren't going to charge explicitly around being a systematic internalizer. We certainly are actively considering being a systematic internalizer because of the benefits that that brings to our clients for the post-trade reporting obligations. Um, but as you say, that to, to work out through early part of next year as to whether the pricing <coughs> differs because of that additional service will be interesting to see played out. I think Lan Yu uh, made an interesting point from the buy side um, and uh, I think they see the opportunities both in pre and post trade transparency so pre trade transparency post trade deferral to give it its the MIFID titles. I think equally the buy side firms are slightly worried about two things uh, well, not, not only two things. Uh, one is that there are going to be so many more venues learn, and I'd like you to talk about this and then Henry as well. So if there are more, let's say, at a guess, another 20, as many as 50 SIs for equities, if HFTs come in on the action by the back end of next year, um, maybe a dozen fixed income SIs, depending on the number of organized trading facilities, um, possibly three to five um, SIs in other asset classes, which I think is some of the most interesting, uh, one of the most interesting developments. And the FCA themselves said there are at least 20 OTF, organized trading facility registrations. So that would take around 260 venues that we have across the EU, north of 300. So I guess my exam question, uh, number one, would be, um, if you're a buy-side firm, how are you going to cope with that complexity? And are there opportunities, in fact, from um, asset servicing point of view or broker point of view, uh, reporting point of view, to actually help the buy-side manage that complexity? Uh, the second is something that appeared in the FT. I don't know whether everybody's seen this, but big concerns about what will happen to voice trading uh, under Method 2. What happens if it's not electronic? I'm particularly interested in what you've got to say there, Len, because are you actually going to start rejecting data? You know, If you see something that isn't really making it from a trade report and or transaction report in that one minute or 15 minute interval, would you start kicking stuff back? And then also then back to Henry, you're sitting post-trade and you're seeing all of this stuff kicking around mm. upstream. Are you feeling happier about that uh, in terms of managing the sorts of issues that could develop in terms of potential for failed settlement? Um, so basically, let's start. Sorry, this isn't fair, really. Held you to the end. Um, who wants to lead off in terms of the uh, fragmentation, the complexity that needs to be managed from the, from the buy side? So Catherine or... Who, 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 who. I'll go with the voice thing first. So yeah, yeah every, every What's the story? because it's really fast because so I'm everyone's that story. Sorry, I'll, I'll shut up in a sec. But the story where <clears throat> what I'm hearing learn is that people would agree something on the phone and then get on an electronic network to formalize yeah, 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 it afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a really interesting story. Yeah. So yeah. it's a it's a voice to to RFQ kind of protocol. Exactly. And 
a lot of the so so Trax is part of the market access. It's a big bond trading platform. You guys probably know. So exactly. So you know, people do things voice right now because you know if you if you're trying to move ten million or something that trades two by two, you have to make five prices pretty quickly on the phone. People know how that works under Trace. They understand you know they can do those five calls and then it's then it's printed. What they know for Mifid two is if it's if it's um, liquid and under a certain size. By the time they're on the phone making call three, the first two will be up there moving the price, and the traders aren't very excited about that. Um, so what they can do is um, they can talk to Barclays or whomever and do a targeted RFQ to say, hey, you know, this is the price we just made, this is the level, and the, and the guy can lift that. And I think that what that does is it brings something that's voice onto a venue, but it has to get in the OMS, I think is the key mm -hmm. thing. And, and that's another challenge for the smaller firms, it not being in the OMS. And Catherine, any thoughts about the best X aspect? Because you can imagine if you're a buy-side firm and you're having to evidence best X to lots of parties, if you look at all that fragmentation, that's going to take, take your policies apart, isn't it, really? Yeah, well, we've certainly been um, very focused on the trading obligation and what that brings in terms of its own challenges, where, for example, there are dual listed securities and the trading obligation may force us to execute that particular trade on a European venue where possibly the, the main source of liquidity is elsewhere and you know what does that mean in terms of best execution? We feel that that best execution has to trump the trading obligation and if there is a a better source of liquidity and you can do better by your clients by trading outside of Europe than then that rule because they conflict with each other directly yeah. the best execution rule should should apply yeah I, I couldn't agree more you would have thought with any dual listed security or the need to evidence equivalence and it's my fear article 23 um, that's a uh, that's a particularly thorny issue because the clocks uh, ticking uh, Tillman Luda from the European Commission has got to sort this out in very, very short order, and it will have uh, post-trade implications as, as well. Henry, um, you've been very patient. <laughs> you must have, I, I can't, I've never seen you look so quiet, Henry, in all my life. I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, what are your general thoughts about what you're hearing upstairs in terms of the pre-trade? Any implications for post-trade? Uh, well, I mean, there are, there are many, and we are just taking a step back, we're a particular stage now where we've moved very much to full-on implementation of MIFID, which is not an island because there are so many other regulations going at the same time. Yes, we've got MIFID coming in on the 3rd of January, but just we've also got things like benchmarks regulation, people working on very hard, uh, also going in at the beginning of January. We've got the CSD regulation and the offer of segregated or omnibus accounts out to participants, uh, CSDs, participants, clients. It's going to be done sometime probably March, April time. And then moving into data protection regulation, which has a big tie in with MIFID uh, on the 25th of May. So all of these things. So we can't just look at MIFID by itself. And also the other thing is so many of these issues, we looked at them in consultation sort of one, two, three years ago, identifying all the things that we thought were problems. It's only really when you start getting into it and implementing it, other issues come out. You go down to your legal department, they write to outside firms of lawyers asking for clarification, going back to regulators, finding out how much, and in some cases, it's quite clear, you're not actually going to receive much further clarification. Uh, and so you actually have to slightly work out what is the, the intention behind this. And if I look at a couple of particular issues uh, at the moment, and I'm going to talk about a trading issue, and that is, what are the reporting obligations on corporate actions? And there in particular, uh, ESMA has issued some guidance on that. And it appears to be the general principle, for example, that these are reportable if there is some form of discretion in that investment decision. Well, then a particular example that is quoted of, of DRIPS or dividend reinvestment plans, where if you've got some blanket authority, uh, that those are not actually um, reportable. On the other hand, you have other cases where it seems to be slightly contradictory in terms of some corporate actions where you might have a takeover, and are you going to choose, as the owner of some of those securities, are you going to take cash, or in which case effectively you're selling your securities, or are you going to take somebody else's shares uh, in replacement for it, and what are you actually going to do? And as I understand it in that particular case, again, it's not reportable, even though it seems to be discretionary. So there is no particularly clear guidance yet. There's a very fundamental, significant mm. part that's what we're going to do with it. And Henry, uh, sorry, uh, do so, you think certain content authorities will ask for it to be reportable, or do you think everybody is just going to say 
too much and just leave it be. Um, I think that people are going to have to look in individual countries as to what guidance they're getting. And yeah, I mean, people are actually right. asking for clarity. We've had the ESMA guidance, yeah. and now it's going to come down to what's happening in individual countries individual to get countries. further guidance mm -hmm. uh, before we start doing it. It's a very key part of reporting. Otherwise, you just find yourself reporting everything, uh, mm -hmm. which, I mean, then the custodians who carry out the corporate actions have actually got to find the direct steps to carry out really pretty high volumes <coughs> of reporting on these things. Mm -hmm. I'd say another angle in the post-trade affecting us is anybody who's safekeeping assets has to carry out quarterly reporting of the portfolios to their clients, which is fine. If you merely want to report, you've got 1,000 Vodafone and 2,000 Glaxo shares. Well, that's what custodians do anyway. Providing a value on that to the standards of MIFID is, is another matter because it may be some cases where those securities are not immediately... Um, listed, maybe illiquid, trying to place the value upon them, in many cases can be quite difficult to the standards of MIFID, which is providing another challenge, which again comes out as a post-trade implication uh, from what's coming on MIFID. And these things, perhaps we should have found them two, three years ago when it's in consultation, but it was so many of these regulations, it's a matter of going back to one's legal departments and outside advisors saying, what do you think this actually means, and ultimately going back to regulators themselves. So there's quite a lot of work going on that is going to be happening for the next two and a half months or one hopes for some sort of um, allowance on that in the speed of implementation so it's not all completely tied down just to see how it slightly works out in practical terms after the 3rd of January. Mm -hmm. I think Henry you brought, a great, brought up a great point there in terms of the, uh, the valuation side um, that is proving to be really quite troublesome in terms of not, not just in the post trade but also uh, for best execution for unlisted securities uh, anything illiquid, obviously. Mm. I think there really is an expectation in the Delegated Act reg um, that uh, they will expect, again, I'm going to switch back to buy-side firms, which is what I tend to be spending my day-to-day -day with. Um, buy-side firms want to know, uh, can I rely on vendor pricing or evaluated pricing out there, or do I need to develop fair value models, just like derivative colleagues? I suppose going back again, Catherine, to best acts, um, Another thing that's rearing its head isn't just the uh, values, but the cost disclosures as well. Um, cost and charges for, for, for those of us who are close on the MIFID and also the PRIPS, the Package Retail Investment uh, uh, and Insurance Products uh, Regulation, which is another one of these indeed, wonderful indeed, things that uh, yeah. we have to manage in the near. <clears throat> um, it's rearing its head. A, a, there are an awful lot of discussions around what is needed ex ante, ex post, um, full-on, illustrative, um, I, could, I could go on, but above all, implicit and explicit uh, costs. And this is coinciding at a time when the FCA is introducing its own asset management market study as well. So, mm. Catherine, any thoughts about costs and charges and where we start? We'll have to pay attention to time because I'm sure we can uh, talk about this for quite some time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll keep it relatively brief, but, uh, you know, we, we're very much involved in the discussions that you reference in terms of industry forums for different types of product sets and different types of trading activity. The, the view on what you disclose as a cost and charge differs broadly. Uh, we've heard the FCA say recently that they, they know this is tough and they expect divergence on day one and that firms really need to put their own plan of action um, and evidence what they think is right um, at the outset, but they don't expect everyone to be aligned. So what does that do to, to a firm that is trying to disclose um, for a, a, a vast array of different types of services and products. Um, it's relatively simple when you think about your services where you are acting as an agent and they're commission-based models. Uh, you know, there is a clear-cut approach, but when you look at the wholesale trading markets and um, how you operate, is a price a price or is there some form of cost implicit in that that should be disclosed is where the, the real challenge is. And I think that's a very good point. Um, <clears throat> there's an expectation by the by the regulator here that uh, when the industry on the buy side isn't just going to focus on the actual cost, it's also going to be looking at justifying value for money. Um, and that's a very, very interesting uh, departure, I think, from any other regulator in Europe. Uh, it just goes to show that um, current direction of travel is going to be very, very evidential. Firms will really have to 
demonstrate or prove to a regulator that they're doing the right things. I mean, this is so much the case in all sorts of regulations. I, mean, I don't want to come in too early on data protection regulation, but that's a major change from the data protection regulation we have already, particularly in the UK, where it's pretty tough. Mm. It is need to demonstrate to the regulator your processes, your policies, for how you are actually keeping that data safe. And so it is so much the case, and how you're actually going to achieve all these various things. And it has meant for something like best execution or conflicts of interest policy, and all these things were put in back in 2007, that in many cases they really weren't very fat policies at, at all. And now they are, they're very fat policies, because so much is the actual practicality of demonstrating, showing somebody who's reading that policy actually exactly how you're doing it. There's a couple of P's on there, Henry. I mean, this time it's personal, the personal data, and I'm sure most of you in the audience will know what personal data is because we always tend to think of national insurance numbers or driving license numbers, but it could extend to IP addresses for your computers as well. Mm. So that's where it's, it gets to be really quite interesting, and it'll, it, for those of you in the audience who are really expecting the innovation side of this panel to come out, that'll get, just keep that in the back of your minds. <clears throat> the second is that this whole proof of work, this uh, prove it to me for the regulator, it's a complete in, uh, inversion. It's almost the, uh, it's not quite an outsource of work, on the part of the regulator, but it's it's very much an admission that um, firms will have to provide evidence. It's what, what's called reverse burden of proof uh, to the regulator that they are doing the right things. Now, what's interesting about MIFID II, and I'm going to switch, if I may, to the second part of this um, panel session. One thing I heard Stephen Hanks say on the 6th of September, which, which I found really quite interesting, there were various areas which he felt might not be completely described in time under MIFID II. The trading obligation being one. Uh, transparency for derivatives was up there. Um, traded on trading venue, trying to get complete closure on that issue. Uh, direct exchange access uh, was another. Supply of legal entity data, where the official position is very much still, remains no LEI, no trade. So if you have a position like no LEI, no trade, uh, there's a very serious possibility that we're going to start the new year and that's going to result in a pretty strong hiccup. Uh, also, the, the introduction of the new transparency regime, the, the pre-trade transparency, post-trade deferral, is possibly going to mean certain sell-side firms not showing quotes <coughs> in quite the same way as they might have done before. So for January 3rd, which is a Tuesday, it's quite interesting here, my friend he pointed out that it's there's an intervening normal day of the year in the Monday. I mean, you reminded me of that, and I think that's a very important point um, when you're trying to manage this on a follow-the-sun basis. Um, thoughts from the panel. What new risks do we think are going to develop as a result of these hiccups? So let's say insufficiency in the supply of LEIs, or if there is... Um, you know, uh, a tendency for the, let's say, the quote-driven the quote markets like bonds or rates uh, to experience some liquidity challenges from, from January 3rd. Uh, starting with you, Catherine, and possibly this is unfair, I don't know, but please all, all, all free, feel free to take up the slack. What do we think is going to be new, true, and different when we introduce Mifid to Start with that. So... I mean, primarily at the immediate outset, I think it's the liquidity risk. It's that and um, what's going to impact that, as you say, people may not be so keen to provide quotes in less liquid areas. But equally, it's just that the overall uncertainty, has my counterpart got an LEI, is, can we trade, particularly where you bring in the the extraterritorial impact and you're dealing with clients around the globe and whether they have all lined up and got their LEIs on time, whether they are equally confused and they have optionality to trade with partners outside of Europe and may choose to do that at the outset to just see how things play out. We're sitting on a panel yesterday with you. Uh, what sort of numbers are we talking about in terms of uh, rate of knots? How many LEIs do we have and where do we need so, to get so to? So we looked roughly? yesterday. It was a, a about 600,000 or just above um, the expectation. I think I quoted a number of one and a half million. I think you said that's, that's possibly even on the low side mm -hmm. of where we expect the number of LEIs to be. So certainly there's a, a, a large gap to close before um, if it goes live in terms of LEIs that should be applied for. <clears throat> and equally, the, the additional challenge is the fact that LEIs do expire annually. They need to be recertified. And of that 600,000 that Glyph are illustrating that have been issued, 29% of those are stale. So it's, 
you know, it, it's a huge challenge. We, we, you know, the panel we were on last night, we were speaking to our own clients and we were urging them, as we do at every opportunity now, to ensure that firstly they've got their LEIs and also a process to manage those LEIs on an annual basis so that they do not expire. And we were beginning to talk about countries where this might be a challenge. And I think it's fair to say um, that possibly less the United States because of the 661,000. I think we had about half of the LEIs assigned for uh, stateside. But uh, the UK, for example, might be challenged. I, I understand the last time I looked at the Global LEI Foundation uh, database, the UK was, was hardly top European country. I think it was number four. Hmm. Len, what are your thoughts? I mean, help us out here. You're sitting in terms of offering uh, trade and transaction reporting tools. How do you think your world's going to change on that Tuesday? Um, I, I, I bet trading will be like. Well, you're going to take the day off. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think uh, yeah, it'll be like um, it'll be like like uh, like like one of those NASA launch kind of control days. So, trading. Yeah, you know, we were talking about this beforehand. I think trading is going to be light because there'll be so many questions from traders about can I trade this entity? I, I want to I want to move this bond. What what jurisdiction can I do it in? Sorry, light by ten percent down, twenty percent down. What sort of? Oh God, I, I hate making predictions like that. Uh, I okay. think because people will be people have to go through so many a, a longer compliance checklist before they can move something. But what I mean by on the internal no, side. no LEI, no trade. Oh, that's if we're, six, if we're well, six sixty thousand versus one and a half million to get. Well, that's when the impacts I could cause the yeah. lightness. <laughs> when do we? That could be you can't trade with them. Hmm. What's my compliance checklist? And then it's just from the trader's point of view. So. When they throw a stone in the pond, you know they're going to make a lot more ripples. So don't forget, there's pre-trade transparency as well. So I, I want to, I have, I have, you know, I come in the morning of Mifid two. I get ten bonds to move. Okay, so I, I look them up. When I when I do an RFQ out there, that's great for my best X, but I'm also signaling to the market an intention, right? So information leakage, whatever you want to call it. All the orders that come back to me, those are those going to be those were possibly printed waivers aside and all that. Those are possibly printed. Okay, so already we have a timeline, and then when I hit something, that's going to be printed um, potentially right away, or if it's not subject to a deferral. Okay, so that that really scares the pants off of traders, as you can imagine, because because they're they're signaling to everybody what they like to keep to themselves. However, one thing, guys, I think to to, to temper that is. From so Trax has we have a lot of pricing and volume data in the bond market, okay, and only about two or three percent of corporate bonds, or fifty to sixty percent of sovereigns, will be printable day one. So actually, on the third of Jan, very little will be printed. Um, there's the, the standard deferrals you guys know is two days. So actually, two days later on the fifth of Jan is when, you know, the little ticker tape, you guys have all seen the 1920s, 30s movies, you know, in Wall Street with a, with a big shot with the ticker tape on his desk. Mm. That's going to start, I will actually use that to explain to people, that is what tr the transparency tape is going to be, right? Mm. That little tape, so here's me holding a little tape from the Morse code machine, will, will start to come to life and, and tick away on the fifth, because that's when most trades will come through. Because everything will get printed eventually, it's just, is it right away or after a deferral? So I think, you know, I think people will get, it'll, it'll take, weeks, I don't know, months to get comfortable with, with when I'm out there, who's going to see what I'm doing? Because, well, you know, like everyone says, two years ago, mm -hmm. a little bit of transparency is a good thing, a lot of transparency is not a good thing. It's a practical issue. If somebody, say Peter Randall in the audience, because he's going he's gonna to ask me a question and, yeah, and help me out on the yeah. innovation yeah. stuff. Um, but uh, seriously, Peter's going to send you some, a file and it, it's missing some um, LEI information or whatever. What, what's going to happen practically? Um, and then Peter, well, I'm sure you. Can I ask my question? Was <laughs> that the question? <laughs> is it live, Peter? That's not your question. <laughs> is it live? It's not live. I'll suggest. No, you, okay, I think it I'll, is. I'll, we I'll can, we can, we can, go on, go on, Peter. So, is there not a lesson, a really important lesson from Mifid One? What happened in Mifid One? Mifid One, really interestingly, Chayek started trading 18 months before the seventh. Of November, oh, sorry, the 2nd of November 2007. No regulator came after us. Mm -hmm. On the day that MIFID went live, we printed a billion euro trades. So just start. Don't, don't sort of, yeah, oh, we can't start yet. Yeah, well, we're not ready. Blah, blah. Just start. Mm -hmm. Make it happen. Are they going to come after you? Probably not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Because if you look at the other side of the coin, which I think is even more important, we've had ISD, lots of sanctions. Regulators did nothing. Supine. Look at MIFID 1. They had tons of regulations that they could come after people for. Did they do anything? No. 
you think might happen in Lifford 2? There are probably quite a lot more regulations. Do you think that anybody's going to actually enforce them? Unlikely. Oh. The only thing it shows is that Mifid 2 will give birth to Mifid 3. Absolutely. Me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> so I really, I'm not sure that we're actually, we're probably being a bit too scared of our own shadow. Is what I'm okay. So, P Peter, let me, um, uh, I, I still want to ask my question of Len. Uh, it took 22 months uh, from Mifid 1 for the first transaction reporting fine to get issued, if yeah. you may remember that, from September 2009. Nine, point, yeah. point really well taken on that one. Um, from Stephen Hanks, um, he said the top three things the FCA are going to look for quality of trade reporting, quality of transaction reporting, and quality of position disclosures. But with respect, the FCA's trade reporting group can't handle the technology that's going to be required in order to do it. So it's, you know, Quite possibly. It's Quite possibly. And we haven't mentioned the F word, the Financial Inst Institution Reference Data System, either. We've been very restrained on that one, not mentioning it. <clears throat> I do want to ask that practical question, because what you said make, makes sense. They're not going to knock on your door on the third and start enforcing straight away. In fact, very important, I'm glad you raised the point, because what the FCA have said is they will not penalise firms, I'm almost quoting David, uh, uh, Stephen Hanks, um, who are demonstrably making an honest effort to get ready in time, okay? So that's to put you at ease. But practically, and just turning this around, if I may, Len, if you're operating a trade and or transaction reporting tool and somebody sends you data which is either missing or incorrect, what is, how does it work in practice? I'm going I'm to reject the hell out of it, yeah. You'll reject the hell out of it. I am finable, so as an APNR, am I finable under Method 2? Mm -hmm. I have to spot obvious errors and emissions in data. Mm -hmm. So if ISINs are an or LEIs are any of the 14 ISO standards, mm -hmm. I, I, my license depends on me rejecting because we're an APA and an ARM re rejecting that. You wouldn't ever interpret? Um, uh, unless there's Sorry, I'm not trying to unless there's the logic set up with the firm and agreed upon and implemented a, a okay, long time helpful. in advance. Yeah. That's helpful to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand the liability <coughs> issues. Anyway. Yeah. Henry, can I just <coughs> say on this point about um, non-enforcement under MIFID 1? I mean, two is a different world in terms of MIFID 1, I think, was about enabling, subject to a certain amount of investor protection. This is about risk mitigation. I mean, the words that have been used by the Commission to describe MIFID 2 are resilient efficient and transparent. And I think there's a great emphasis on the resilient um, in terms of the overall safety. So in terms, I think that an awful lot of things like the policies for, uh, let us say, conflicts of interest and inducements and best execution with those rather thin policies I mentioned last time around, I think that on the uh, routine review carried out of MIFID 1 and how it had been put in place, um, in some cases I suspect that regulators thought we've been had um, that this actually needs to be a great deal tougher. So I, mean, I really wouldn't rely too much on MIFID 2 being the same as MIFID 1 in its enforcement. I think uh, the I think other thing, <clears throat> Henry, to back you up there, <clears throat> then I'll hand back to, to Peter. Uh, we have the small thing of a financial crisis. And we've got the politicians all over us as well. Um, so I think going back to those glory days of 2007, sadly, are uh, uh, not going to happen. But in terms of the glory days to come, and this is where I really would like your, your thoughts on this, Peter, given the fact we've heard a lot about blockchain, and AI, and natural language programming, and machine learning, that sort of thing. And uh, this session, and also the last Zitsi session. Very interested in terms of whether you think MIFID II and the implementation there takes us closer towards taking advantage of uh, innovative technologies to come, and also the potential for disruption. So, Peter, can I ask? Can I put you on the spot there? Uh -huh. the sitting in uh, as um, how you um, see this from a SETL yeah, point of view. Uh, Anthony, the, the, as the complexity of meeting regulatory obligations increases, and I don't see that going away mm. anytime soon, mm. driven by something else a lot more importantly, which I suspect we're all sort of lulled into a false sense of security over, mm. which is that since 2008-9, we've had interest rates at almost zero. Mm. When interest rates start to rise again, which it seems likely that they are now finally managing to get a little bit of head of steam behind them, you're going to see an enormous amount of messing around at the fringes. A lot of the companies that have started up in the last five to seven years, based around free money, are going to start to fail. So the emphasis will be on the stronger, more stable, more reliable, better run banks. Yes, I'm sure that's the case. 
And I suspect that, that what that means is that the regulators are going to be trying to sort out all the rubbish that's happened in the last seven years. And that, in a sense, to Henry's mm. point, if you are making an honest and proper attempt at doing things, yeah. you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. But I would just, just urge, well, having done this on many occasions in many different businesses, I would just urge that people don't start to take the, the gold plating option because you'll never get the payback from it. Mm. Just do it as light as you possibly can. Take as light as you possibly can. Mm. Tony, Tony uh, for, for me, all I've heard is negativity about nothing, there's no, not enough LEIs, people are starting late in September, oh. we've got so much to do, uh, maybe regulators don't have time to look at everybody's reporting, maybe there will be liquidity in, in that first week. What's going to happen in that first week of January? Are we going to see lots of people being um, uh, shouted at by the FCA, or are we going to be seeing lots of people having no trading? There's just moving the cash. What's going to happen? What, what, what do we see? What do we, what do you, what, you know, you're the experts. I would say for the, for, if I could just term. start on yeah, for, sorry, Henry, for the, for the, 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 me the medium to long term, I'd say, you know, I think that it, it'll be okay. Practicality will actually, developing your point, will actually intervene and it will happen. We look back, all sorts of previous regulations, be it Alternative Investment Fund Manager Directive, USITS 5, with things like depository liability, reverse burden of proof. Everybody was throwing up their hands in horror saying we can't do that at the very beginning. And somehow, you know, it all happened. And, and it wasn't actually a, a big faff and a worry at the end of it all when it actually went into place. Basel three with uh, putting but in see, the, all of that. But way. that first week, that first week, I mean, it really comes back this to what Len was yeah. talking about. And uh, there might be a certain amount of circumspection about it. But I've seen the same as you, where I've challenged something and it has to go to outside council, it goes through every, the whole rigmarole. And we don't have time for the, for the regulator to actually opine again or the outside council. So you kind of have to take a business decision or a regulatory risk decision yep. to do what you think is the right thing to do. And maybe, you know, we do this all the time, I guess, but mm. the, 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 that's what, you know, I, I see. It, 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 it's been delayed once. Maybe, will there be any delay, I, I guess my point is? Well, politically, I think there's no appetite to really delay it wholesale. Um, because there are too many other, as Henry was saying, other regulations like the benchmark, uh, the GDPR, and the CSDR. P uh, PSD2, which we didn't mention on the payment side, it's all, it's all kind of hinging on it coming together. Yeah, and then, yeah. <laughs> you, you get back in your box. <laughs> no, but jokes apart, um, it, it, it's quite interesting if we talk about um, <clears throat> what MIFID is going to do in terms of unintended consequences as well. Uh, because one of the things that has not been debated, and, and I'm glad Catherine sort of brought it up at the panel um, yesterday, was looking at the FX market as well. Uh, that's one of the things I don't think the authorities uh, set out to uh, regulate right at the outset. We now have an FX code of conduct, of course. Um, Catherine, any thoughts uh, about where you see uh, spot FX and uh, FX forwards going? Because there's a uh, clearing um, uh, regulation uh, EMEA going side uh, in, in parallel with all of this. Do you think that's going to formalize that part of the landscape when, when we've got our eyes on the securities and the normal derivative side of the business? Yeah, well, certainly we've, you know, being very big players in FX, that's an area that we've been very focused on. And when it comes to, you know, obviously everyone's aware that FX spot is not a MIFID financial instrument and therefore out of scope. Um, but what does that actually mean? When isn't a spot trade a spot trade? When does it become a forward? There are some technicalities in the regulation that allow a, a trade up to T plus five to be a spot trade in some circumstances. So how do we manage our, our, our trades and our data internally to apply MIFID in certain circumstances, not in others? Um, we also spoke yesterday around FX swaps and the fact that there is still an ongoing debate between the industry and GFXD and ESMA as to what an FX swap looks like. Um, is it two different, uh, a spot and a forward or two forward trades, or is it a package transaction with one icing code? Um, clearly the industry and ESMA are not aligned on that. Um, Back to the point earlier, you know, we have to make a call and, and go with it. So we're lining up to, to still report two different icing codes for an FX swap. How would anyone on these post-trade ticker tapes ever spot a swap trade? Yeah. Know, I think the other thing which... How uh, meaningful is that data? Raise its ugly head was uh, the, the E word, the extraterritorial 
extraterritorial reach of MIFID II. It's, it's interesting, uh, Peter and I were just having a conversation about ICOs just now, because uh, there are re certain regulators in Asia PAC, Singapore, China, etc., uh, are, are paying close attention to where this is going to go uh, and whether these are going to get ahead of steam. But you know, whether we're talking research, whether MIFID II uh, rules apply to the United States and the SEC, um, do they apply in terms of uh, disclosures around the world in terms of the trading obligation and equivalent venues? All of this is sort of coming together. Uh, Henry, uh, from the point of view of regulations in general, mm. um, how, do we make, how do we make these European measures sit side by side with global measures? I mean, you've, you're obviously sitting in HSBC. You, you must see quite a bit of this. Interesting point. You do have to deal slightly case by case. It is certainly a matter of concern to certainly out in various parts of the Far East and Asia Pacific. It's uh, people do raise the topic. So if you are an asset manager using a, a, a European broker, uh, you will need to liaise with the European broker to find out what information you need to provide for doing the trades within Europe. Uh, if you are uh, based as some sort of service provider outside Europe and you have an EU client, again, you will need to talk to the local regulator to find out actually what you are able to do. Uh, and so, I mean, it is fair, and that is just under MIFID. If one's looking at things like the benchmarks regulation, uh, in that where we're talking about the approval of benchmarks or what you're allowed to use because benchmarks have got to be registered with ESMA in order for them to be used for performance measurement of funds and lots of other things that are contained within uh, benchmarks regulation, then that's absolutely fine if you've got European benchmarks being regu um, uh, reg uh, <coughs> regulated and approved by ESMA. But if you are measuring against, let's say, the Brazilian Stock Exchange Index, does that index have to be registered with ESMA for one to continue to be able to use it? So there are a lot of cases in here which are really quite individual and bespoke that I'm afraid do need to be looked at in individual circumstances. Think, uh, you can't really generalise. Great for lawyers and probably consultants as well. <laughs> I'm conscious of time. I'm also happy to take a, a question from the floor as well. But uh, before I uh, have a uh, show of hands on any questions, uh, any areas of interest there? Otherwise, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to tell me one benefit that's going to come out of MIFID II. How do they see... Um, Good bonus for you, Tom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they can't think of anything, I'll well, put some ideas. <laughs> I mean, it is, in, in addition to being the revision of MIFID I, it is also the enactment of a large part of the G20 requirements in terms of the trading requirements that came out of that communique back in September 2009. And so it's the way of us doing this, putting it on a more codified international standard um, of risk mitigation that came out of G20 under Obama and everybody else when they first looked at this uh, back in uh, 2009. So it is that codification which should actually increase transparency of what's going on in world markets and thereby with uh, the trading venues control as well, so, mitigate the risk so of it happening very again. very quickly, Henry. So do you think other countries are going to follow the MIFID gold standard? Do we, let's say in Asia back, do you think that the, if I'm in Hong Kong, the SFC or Singapore, the MAS, am I going to Well, steadily because they're part of G20, yes. And so, I mean, in due course mm. they've got to. I mean, you know, we've got the uh, derivatives reform and clearing and reporting has happened already. And so you find various other parts of the trading probably happen in due course, but it, it'll be slow. There wasn't a banking crisis in Asia, the same was there in America, America and uh, Europe. So is that a cautious thumbs up in terms of opportunities? Or oh, I think so. Or big oh, thumbs up? Oh, it was, uh, no, it's, it's a cautious thumbs up. Cautious. So a lot of this is about risk mitigation, not about the enabling. Good point. Len? Opportunities? Um, I think uh, from a standards point of view, moving to ISIN, it's a pain, but I think that that's that's good. It makes data more more fungible, and I think the the exhaust, which is the data that comes out of it, you know, that timeline about the, you know, the RFQs, the the pre-trade transparency, the post-trade transparency. Don't forget that's all tied together with clock sync, right? So that data should be very good. That gives. I think you should look at that ingesting that data for price formation. It's a, it's a very front office thing. I think that's a big positive. And could we get ISINs for all those derivatives, all the OTC derivatives? It'll work if if the ANA DSB delivers. There's so such a high expectation on that to yeah. deliver as promised. But if it does, then I think you'll have a common language. Sadly, it'll be an ISIN per deal as opposed, you know, we'll lose that thought of an ISIN as a product and everything, right. you know, falls into that hierarchy. It's almost ISIN per deal, which is a pain. It just becomes a data headache. 
Um, and I think that if firms, like I said earlier, firms can use, if you can find ways to creatively use this high quality data internally, mm -hmm. and it better be high quality because your jobs depend on it, um, you'll, that can be a benefit to the firms internally. So that definitely sounds like a plus. Yep. Catherine? Uh, data again, um, it, just in terms of all the data that's available in the market, I stand firm that at the outset, it, it won't be a benefit. There will be lots of confusion as to what's being um, made public and what it is and whether things are being made public in duplicate or not. But over time, as, as people get more comfortable with what is being made public, what to look out for, what to see, then of course there are going to be uses around that extra transparency in the market. Just got to say from the chair, what I'm seeing um, from the research I do, the buy side firms is four different categories of vendors are going to do very well as well. Let's not forget the supplier side because that's the, the community that's going to make all of this work. Uh, the order management system vendors are going to do very, very well out of it because the idea that you have your own proprietary system and maintain that is, is dead. Um, if you're offering uh, market data consolidation oh. tools, um, any kind of pointers in terms of front office analytics are going to do very well. Thirdly, surveillance, uh, combining the market abuse regulation, the anti-money laundering, and also the requirements on MIFID algo trading. Uh, and last but not least, transaction cost analysis. Uh, uh, that is going to uh, really gather ahead of steam too. Cool. So I think for those of you in the audience who are from the vendor side, I think 2018 could be very interesting indeed. So conscious uh, of time, I wanted to finish on time because Nigel yeah. would be happier that way. Could we all put our hands together? Thank the panel for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.